Okay, welcome everybody. I'm going to start kicking off the um, wonderful and exciting event we've got today. Um, but I just wanted to say to everybody who is watching, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Fantastic. Each year we run um, events. They've been amazing over the years. And I think only to be topped today by our special guest, um, who I will ask Rachel to introduce you to in a minute. But obviously, we are delighted to welcome Ruby Wax to our International Women's Day event and to thank her very much for taking the time out to come and join us um, and to hear some of her stories about um, life in general and being a woman. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Rachel O'Riordan, who is the um, Artistic Director of the Lyric Theatre, the Jewel in the Crown in Hammersmith and Fulham who's very kindly um, offered to be the, um, dare I say, Fiona Bruce for today's uh, events. Um, uh, so I'm going to hand straight over to them. I don't want to waste any more time because there's lots to talk about. But just to say thanks, everyone, for joining. And thank you, Rachel and Ruby. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank hey. you. It is a great delight um, to be asked to interview the iconic Ruby Wax. I am genuinely a massive fan, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Ruby Wax, actor, comedian, documentary maker, presenter, activist, mental health campaigner, all round iconic woman on International Women's Day. Thank you, Ruby, for coming to talk to us. Thank you, I'm so glad I'm all those things to you. Ah, you absolutely are, and I think to a lot of women. And we're gonna talk into that a little bit today with Ruby. Um, I'm gonna start with a quote from Ruby herself, um, which is this. Humans are at their best working as a team and empathy is the glue that sticks them together. I think that's an extraordinary quote and it feels really interesting to share today and on every other day, but really very significant today coming from someone like Ruby, like you Ruby, whose career has reached people in so, so many different ways. As I said earlier, actor, writer, activist, comedian, mental health campaigner, the diversity of Ruby's career is extraordinary. What drives you, Ruby, to reach out to people in so many ways? Well, <clears throat> originally, when I was in my 20s, it really wasn't to reach out to people. <laughs> I uh, came from a dysfunctional background, and I wanted to get as far away as I could. And I thought, if I get really um, uh, appreciated by a lot of people, it would make up for uh, a lack of interest at home. So that was my drive, is to get as many people as I could to um, <clears throat> accept me. It wasn't about other people. Later in life, it becomes about giving back. But in the beginning, it really is narcissism and me, me, me. So that was the original motor. The original. Then it becomes a little distasteful later in life. And it's time to turn it around. But that was the original engine. Even that answer, I think, speaks to speaks to your bravery. I think even the fact that you took the, 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 the courage to answer the question I just asked in that way, it speaks to your own bravery. And you do seem to put great store on people, other people. And that bravery has translated into you talking openly about many things and in particular, your own struggles with mental health, which is an extraordinary act of bravery to speak as openly as you have. What, what is it about you that thinks that you have the courage to share that inner pain, if you like, and why? You know, you, you use this word bravery and courage. I don't feel it. From my insights, that doesn't feel it. I just, uh, uh, in the beginning with the depression, I didn't tell anybody because I th thought it was quite shameful that somebody who has, you know, their own, you know, I can afford to buy my own shoes. What do I have a right to be depressed about? Because I thought depression was the same as other people did. It was a mood thing and I could snap out of it. So there was, I had no bravery. I kept my mouth shut because I'd be fired from my job if they found out. I think that still might be going. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, it was only because I've said this, but Comic Relief put my posters up on tube stations with a picture of, of me which I never, they never told me they were gonna do it. It said on it, one in four people have mental illness. One in five people have dandruff, I have both. And they didn't ask my permission. So I saw it and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna get busted. So I thought, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write a play and I'm gonna pretend that was my poster for the West End. Wow. 
I didn't have a play, so I had to write one. And then I performed it in mental institutions for two years to my people, and they really liked it. And then somehow it got, it, it started to get into real theaters. I forgot how, probably the narcissism again. And it was one in four people. Well, that's a pretty big audience. And then from there, uh, because I started to meet my people, which is always comforting to me, I thought, let's write a show for everybody and realize that everybody's frazzled. One in four around have mental illness, that's different than frazzled. But if people speak vulnerably, vulnerable vulnerably to me i'm really comfortable i cannot take when people are putting me on yeah. um, it, it, my language is quite uh authentic i like that mm. I, maybe i speak it naturally it's not a bravery thing i just can't take bullshit yeah 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 there's a there's a, the word vulnerable is interesting because i think it is the case that women who express or admit to vulnerability can feel that they're not that that's very risky because you might not be trusted with a big gig. You might not be trusted with a responsibility. You might be seen to be unreliable because of that vulnerability. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I'm doing a, I'm teaching mindfulness tonight online. It's one of my first, but I used to, and I say, when I was studying mindfulness, I used to say to my professor, I can't talk about the C word, which is compassion. It's not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my dad wanted a son, so he raised me as a boy. And so I learned, don't show vulnerability. Yeah. Then he said, you know, when you do mindfulness, you watch the thoughts inside your head. There's a reason for it. You watch them, but you watch them with compassion. And he said, the fact that you can even sit there, which you have to do when you do mindfulness, and, and observe your thoughts without beating yourself up. He said, that's compassion. And that made it much easier. And then of course, when you can show it to yourself, then you can, not intentionally, but you can start to use it with other people because you realize that they also have a um, shit show going on in their brains. And so you feel compassion for them and you don't take it so personally because the way we think to ourselves in our heads is how we talk to other people. So if they're being quite vile to you, they probably think vile to themselves. And that then you then you switch on compassion. Is that the question? It is. And that that and also, I'm training men now to show vulnerability because they're not getting away with it anymore. People will not buy products from you. They won't trust you. They won't have rapport with you unless you get out of that suit and start to speak human. And so part of what I do is teach men how to do this because they know they can't sell anymore with their, you know, with their macho exteriors. Do you have to find in yourself more compassion when you're doing that work with men? Than no, I'm doing it, um, I'm, it's a job. Mm -hmm. I, and I think it's amusing. You know, it's like, what am I teaching you? This is like, this is human nature. But then again, when you practice mindfulness, they do teach mindfulness with compassion because uh, it's something we've gotten rusty with. Everybody has a facility when they were little kids. Mm -hmm. Everybody was vulnerable and had, you know, love for their parents if if it was a healthy relationship. But because we live in a culture that bombards you with stress, we lose those human f faculties. So when I'm training them, it's really not their fault. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us women too, we, we're not in touch with the vulnerable side because we think it's weakness. Yeah. And oh, we're taught it's weakness. We're taught it's weakness. Yeah, we try and find ways to cover it up. Mm -hmm. And your complete diverse career, the, the amount of areas that you've reached into, it strikes me that the overarching theme, because being an actor is an act of empathy. You're trying to reach an audience. You're trying to tell someone else's story. I mean, the whole process of being an actor is stepping into someone else's shoes and imagining what it might be like to be them. That is an act of empathy in itself. And you started out as an actor and you worked at the RSC and you said yourself and some of the research I've done on you that you blagged your way into the RSC. Would you like to say a little bit about that? Cause it's, it just sounds fun to me. And then we'll talk more about, about Frazzle Cafe and so on. Well, I, I was, uh, I decided I'd be a classical actress based on nothing. <laughs> well, I was in uh, Evanston based on nothing. I couldn't get into any <laughs> other schools in America and there's thousands. And then I came here and tried to get into the big ones here and failed RADA seven times and um, really was deeply untalented. My dad saw me acting once and said, if I ever see that again, you're gonna be punished. Wow. So I came and uh, auditioned over and over again, 
with my wimple. I made a homemade wimple out of cardboard so I, I could do Juliet. Mm -hmm. And some people told me later it was the most grotesque sight they ever seen. <laughs> Because I'd make myself cry. I knew Juliet was upset in the beginning of the scene. So I'd stand there going to get myself in the mood. I'd go, my dog is dead. My dog is dead. And then I could make myself cry. Then I was incomprehensible. But I um, did get into drama school in Glasgow because they were looking for the weird. Yeah. And uh, yeah, in Glasgow, I was considered normal. And wow. then uh, after that, I was, I never got a part even in drama school. And I was paying. And my class complained third year and so I worked really hard for my end of end of uh you know um school you, you do a show and you audition in front of directors yeah yeah so I, I worked really hard and I got the gold medal and then I um worked really hard again and clawed my way into the Royal Shakespeare Company and then clawed my way into being best friends with Alan Rickman and he became my mentor and taught me how to do comedy Wow. And at the beginning at the RSC, I was just playing house plants and nuns. And then I eventually got pretty good parts. <laughs> it's that's extraordinary because being a brilliant actor, being any actor, it's a combination of you know, I well, we will yeah, never I, know, right? I started writing my own shows while I was in the RSC and I would cast the really famous people to be my handmaidens. <laughs> so I started writing and Rickman would direct. I actually, over the weekend, I watched an episode of French and Saunders in which you play the controller of BBC and you oh, wow. are brilliant in that. It's hilarious, people. You should watch it. You can get it on um, BBC iPlayer. There's an episode of French and Saunders in which Ruby plays where French and Saunders are trying to pitch an idea and Ruby plays the controller of BBC who, who morphs their idea into something similar than you've just that you've just described actually where she makes the there's a series of uh, Shakespeare plays and Ruby's Ruby's controller character makes them a uh, French and Saunders play the small parts so that sounds really similar but there's a combination of courage confidence and vulnerability I think in in the act of going on stage because it's such a t scary thing to do you're asking for trouble aren't you you are asking for trouble yeah but then it's like doing an extreme sport you're <laughs> stage and you're scared but then you're riding a um you're like it, as if you were on a um, snowboard or something you ride the edge so you're scared and then you're elated and then you're scared and then you're elate, elated and it goes back and forth and that's a real adrenaline kick if you're and you like that adrenaline, mm. you like it when you're doing well when you do badly and crash you could end up in a hospital so I practice mindfulness now because it helps me with my edge. With your edge? With the edge. Before, I can't tip too much one way or the other. It really helps keep the, um, you know, the cortisol, the stress hormone down. So when you lose it, you can pull yourself back on stage. Wow. And that's an easy feat. I used to have to run off. Did you? Yeah, I did once when I was doing my show at the Donmar that Alan Rickman directed. And I forgot what I was saying. So I had to run into the um, dressing room to look it up. And Alan said, when I was missing, the laughs got louder and louder and louder because they thought I just left. Mm -hmm. um, but you're shitting yourself. Yeah. Came back on and pretended everything was normal. See, that's resilience, right? To be able to get back on that stage, having that happen, that in itself. Yeah, but I don't know how to cook. And it, the idea of going into a kitchen, I could already break out into a sweat. Part of it is because my mom wanted me to stay away from fire. So in order, so she taught me the German way, which is put my hand in the flame of the stove. And so I, I still am terrified to go near a stove. So the idea of making a dinner party already breaks me out in hives, whereas going on a stage, nothing. So it depends what your fear is. Right. Right. That's interesting, isn't it? And like the, talking about edge and cortisol and fear and one's own edge. And the, is that part of the reason? And you're, and I, I keep coming back to this, but your authentic interest in people, humans, setting up Frazzle Cafe, what, what drove you to do something so novel? Um, well, I always want, because of being an only child and the bizarre parents, I always sat in our living room window and would stare out at the people in the park and they'd have clusters of people having barbecues and playing basketball. And I, I 
my dog was next to me and he wanted out too. And I really want to be part of a tribe, part of a group. So I've always had this yearning, but not just to be in the party, you know, with um, more, you know, whatever they, their themes were, you know, mm -hmm. like the, the posh, when I got here, it was just, yah, 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 but they all hung out together. And I just didn't have the interest, but I, I did envy the kind of the, the gaggle of them. So then when I, um, I, I tried to get into AA, but I'm not an alcoholic, so they didn't have me. And then I went, I was talking, I do talks for companies. I was talking to Marks and Spencers and I said, my dream is, is to form little clusters, groups where people would have each other's backs and they could speak honestly from the heart. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of calling Starbucks to ask if they would let me use their cafes after closing hour. And they said, no, we'll give you our cafes. So right. four years ago, they gave, frazzle me the run of uh, the cafes after hours and sometimes during hours and 12 people that was the idea would meet with a facilitator who would um there's a format you can't drop in it's they'd meet every two weeks and some of them stayed together for three years and they did they felt like a community wow. of course if you couldn't make a meeting you wouldn't come and we have a waiting list blah 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 but the nub of it was to stay you know everybody felt that they were family because a lot of people don't really want to speak honestly to their family or their relations. So this became a substitute. Then when lockdown happened, I took over and for, for the bigger groups, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, back then I did it every night. And in the day we have hosts. So if you sign on, you can join um, a group of 12 at any time wow. and uh, free. And it does do what it says on the package. It's, it's safety people um, speak from the heart. You're not allowed to talk about the news. They have one or two minutes to say what they're, what's going on, but then there's breakout rooms. So we replicate what was going on in the cafes. People could meet and really, you know, be honest with each other. Nobody ever goes over their two minutes. There's never chaos because what you feel on that screen is love. And you see young and old in every different color, nodding, going, oh, that's me too. Now that was my dream. So I get it every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because I get as much pleasure listening as they do listening too. That you say that was your dream and your dream wasn't a, in a way isn't about you your dream you, the way you just described that moment Ruby is you said I see these people nodding and they're all different and that's what you're getting your love and you feel that love from so it's altruism. It, it feels like altruism, but the way you frame it is you keep talking about it as if it's nothing to do with you, but it, it feels like it's so driven by you. And again, back to, back to what drove you to set it up for other people? The, the, no, my loneliness, and then I can feel theirs. Mm. Everybody's isolated. Everybody's even isolated. Isolation. And then it makes me feel good because I know how terrible it feels to be alone. Do you think that's obviously got worse in lockdown? Do you think that these cafes were more necessary than ever? Um, yes, it's more in lockdown because it's it's physically a reality. But we were always isolated. Yeah. In my lifetime because we don't speak the same language. Everybody has to pretend they're doing really well. Yeah. You're not allowed to be vulnerable. You're not allowed to fail. You can't say anything's wrong. It's a mess. So this at least we've created a little island of, um, you know, what we what we humans were put on earth for, which was, as I said before, compassion is the glue. Compassion. And get ahead of it. Yeah. And your book, and now for the good news, is really speaks to that because in it you you look for the good literally you reach and you find people who are doing extraordinary things extraordinary acts of of progression and compassion across the globe and it's an extraordinary piece of work and um it's a it's a joyful thing um can you talk about it a bit and why you wrote it oh well this is my last book and now for the good news to the future with love two years before the pandemic because i finished it the day it started i wanted to you know, where you put your attention defines who you are at any moment. And it defines, you know, the neural networks. So if you keep your eyes on the negative, you will be negative. So I thought I was as negative as everybody else. You couldn't get enough of the news. It was one disaster after another. So I intentionally threw my focus and went around to find out people who were not positive and gooey, but were really doing things that were, I call them the green shoots, yeah. which is 
nurture, they will be the future. So in schools, you know, how they're teaching empathy in some schools, by the way, state schools, how um, businesses are set up to be, and they're called conscious capitalism, and they're not small. These are big businesses. And then community, how communities are being set up. I even moved to one of them. Um, how health is being, and it all has to do with teamwork. We can't work each yeah. man for himself. Every single model in technology too, is about um, the feeling that we're, that it's, n it's not, no man is an island. That's what makes us yeah. ill. Yeah, and this, and this is back to the quote I started with. That, that, that you, I read that, you said that years ago, this isn't a new quote, you know, that's a, yeah. uh, um, something that, that you've okay. lived with for a long time, that you've been trying to rationalize for yourself and for other people for not, it's not a recent thing. It's not a fashionable moment. This is something you've been crafting in your own life for quite some time. Yeah, but it, A, it didn't exist. So that's why I did Frazzle. I mean, the Quakers did it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we did it hundreds of thousands of years ago. But OK, so I did it with Frazzle. But how exciting to see that it was happening in schools and in communities and, it, and, and all the way down the board. And they called it Team Human. It's, it's actually, that's the catchphrase. Team Human. What an incredible thing. I mean, that, that's, that speaks to me so much. I mean, we, myself and my colleagues in the Lyric Hammersmith Theatre, that, that, that's it. We, we're a team and the audience, everything is about trying to tell stories that mean something that matter to people. So it chimes really strongly with me. And I think with probably lots and lots of people on this call who do lots of different things in, the, in their own life. But none of us are an island, no matter what we do for a living and no matter how much we might feel like an island in the moment in lockdown, we're not. We don't, we, it's no fun being on your own in, and, and your whole ethos seems to be about joining people, listening to each other, helping each other. You even, you say, you mentioned you went and moved to a community as an eco, eco community called Findhorn, right? In Scotland, is that right? Yeah, could you say a bit about that? Well, in the, in the uh, um, chapter on community, I went to see different, there's about 10,000 of them. One of them is South London called Bedzed. And again, it's, um, some of it is free housing, but they know how to get, for all you eco people, you know, yeah, some people were going on about it. Well, walk the talk already. Yeah. So they do know how to reduce the heating bills. They do, it's not off grid, but they know how to use turbine. They know where the windows should be facing the place in South London too, that they have a, an area where you can grow your own vegetables. You don't live off it, but it's there. And then there's always a community center. So elderly people can take care of the babies. Ah. And, uh, yeah, there is a sense of neighborhood and there are also replicas in cities. So, but the, the one that started 60 years ago is in Findhorn and it started off quite hippie and was a commune, but now, because um, the, it, now there's the biggest condensation of uh, startups. And if you want to talk about eco, they're 20 years ahead. Wow. Okay, there's little leftovers of the whole hippie thing, but there's professors living there and doctors and whatever, but they do have until COVID. You can eat together if you want, not every night, you know, you can, you have that possibility. There are community meetings. There's hubs where you can meditate. There used to be activities going on where people from the outside would learn about, I don't know, there were, you know, they could learn about how, what biomass is, or they could learn, I don't know, salsa, whatever. They had a community center where you could learn things. Yeah. Right. But I went there in the summer because I was I first I was taking the piss out of it. I thought it was hilarious when I wrote for the book. But then the smile got wiped off because suddenly I'm working in the um, communal gardens where the food goes to a food bank. Wow. And I didn't even know tomatoes came out of the ground or off a vine. I didn't know. I never dealt with dirt before. And suddenly there was a moment where I, start, I felt something on my face and I went and touched it and I realized I was smiling. <laughs> And oh. women there are earth women you know these are not they speak and there's no garbage and you know some more teachers we're not talking about hippies here we're talking about people that intentionally you know they can work online but they intentionally work and they're very um, grounded I like being around grounded people so they're building little eco houses so I got one it's not built yet but it will be and it's teeny teeny but I like being around those people I don't like there's, they genuinely look you in the eye. Some people, you know, I don't, 
you're not friends with everybody, but some people you sit down and you feel like you've known them for years. But you made that happen. This is the thing. You, you've taken stock. You've reached out. You've looked for solutions. You've created solutions. You've been front foot in trying to find positivity. And you say you're not brave, but I think that's an immensely brave thing. I don't see it like that. I just see it like I'm on the hunt all the time because there's an itch from childhood mm. to find this group. An itch from childhood. Yeah, this, this, it's a fascinating life that you're living and the choices you're making and choosing to share. I think that's what's really exciting for, for everyone listening, I'm sure, is that we get, you're, you're very open about yourself and we can all learn from each other. So your openness informs, informs everybody else's understanding of themselves and each other. I, well, people are contagious. I like, I didn't make the, this expression of we work like neural Wi-Fi. So <laughs> if I can steady my stress, that doesn't mean I don't get stressed, but you know, with mindfulness, I do it. I can get the cortisol down. Then I pass that state to the next person. If I'm a wreck, like I did it this or yesterday, I lost my temper. I watched how it hit everybody else. Um, you know, you're, it's like a pinball machine. So yeah. we pass whatever we're on into, uh, to the next person. And that's why frazzled is so interesting because this open hearted thing, it passes through everybody. This is amazing. I think that is a brilliant segue Ruby into if you would take some questions. Sure. This sure. pinball, let's pinball now. Um, the way we're going to do this is if you want to ask a question, could you put up your hand on your Zoom and I will look out for you and unmute you so you can ask your question. Oh, okay. I'm going to start with, let's have a look. Who's, who's got a question for us? For Ruby? Nobody. Nobody at the moment. I'm sure they do. They're just being shy. All right, well, they can think about it for a few minutes. We've got some questions in the chat. Um, oh, brilliant, thank you. That's right, the first one is, which females have inspired you in your life? Oh, well, for different things, for different reasons. I mean, Jennifer Saunders is a genius. Mm. I mean, a certain front she wouldn't inspire me, but as a writer, it's not, I could never achieve it, but I see her brain. And it's um, unbelievable. So what, I'm just in awe of it. Um, yeah, she's incredible. Yeah, female politicians, you know, not Maggie Thatcher, but, um, you know, in New Zealand and uh, when they have the nerve. And also when Hillary Clinton stood up against, um, you know, during those debates, kept her wits about her and didn't catch the infection of so much rage and madness. I will I'll always respect her for that. You know, to stand there and take it and keep her cool, that was majestic. So um, whatever, you know, you can always pick holes in everybody, but you have to admire them for, you know, specific areas. Yeah. You had a brilliant working relationship, it seems, with um, Jennifer Saunders. Yeah. That felt like a real symbiotic, um, fun, uh, kind of joyful with the pro helena kennedy is a good friend of mine she's my heroine um she's unbelievable you know she that is heroic what she does mm -hmm. and she has that quick brain and she's funny and she's authentic yeah she's got it all helena kennedy yeah, she really does. It. Anybody else, any other questions we'd like to run through there? Anybody else got anything they'd like to ask? Oh, oh hello. Uh, Anne, is that? I'm hoping I'm using this system correctly. Can I Yeah. If you want me to help, I can see somebody with their hand raised, Kim Smith. Great. Thank right? you. Okay, Kim, I'm going to unmute you now if you'd like to share. Thank you so much. There we go. Hi, Kim. Yeah. If anybody doesn't want to come on, but they want to ask a question, can we do it that way too? Yeah. 
Yes, I think we might be in a start because people are trying to unmute Kim at the same time and so she's been muted again. So I'm just going to unmute Kim. So um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Hi, Hi Kim. can you hear Hi. me? Yes, yeah, gotcha. Hello. I can see you too. Uh, can't, can't miss this opportunity to ask the amazing Ruby Wax uh, a question. Um, qu um, Ruby, just say a little bit more, please, about um, on the one hand, um, we've got to minimise imposter syndrome and we've got to feel really good and great about um, achievement and uh, leadership and competing in a man's world. And then on the other side, what you said really chimes with me about showing your own vulnerability and trying to be human. I'm the chief executive of the finest borough of Hammersmith and Fulham um, Council, and it's a tough gig because on yeah. the one hand, um, I wear the job like a jacket, know when to take it off. Um, uh, I often say when I'm in Asda in my flip-flops, people think that I'm trying to steal the shaving products. So it's very difficult trying to grow into the job. But say a little bit more about women and muscle management and about well-being around trying to succeed in your own style and in your own way when it's very very competitive and it's very um um it's not as friendly it's it doesn't show the compassion that you're talking about we don't talk to each other we talk above each other so just say something more about that please yeah you know kim there's a i, I i'm not in business so it's you know again it's easy for me to say i don't work nine to five so it's a different set of muscles. You know, I have the luxury coming from an artistic background of saying this, but you know, um, uh, this idea of who your authentic self is and who you have to be to navigate the world, we have to put masks on. You know, I'm not talking about, let's just let ourselves be. As long as you know who that person is, you know, who you are when you have the flip-flops on and you consciously put on the front. You know, we need to be tough sometime. I mean, you know, mindfulness does that too. Like, when do you have to put the um, the throttle into turbo? You know, if somebody's, and so, but the, the authentic self bit is the one with the instincts. So it's like, there are some people who need their asses kicked. So uh, if you decide that is the only way you're going to hear me, at least when you've got, I'm speaking very much mindfulness, when you've got your hand on the core or you've got the idea, you can give it to them, but without getting involved, Do you know, because the worst is when you spew that, that stress hormone, you can't control it. Like we humans are partly animal. It's hard to catch it back and it becomes personal and becomes ugly. Um, and I'm working on this all the time. This is tough. So it's, it's acting it rather than being it a little bit. So if you need it, it also means that when you come back to yourself, you can get the cortisol down faster because I like study, I, I've studied humans. So, you know, and their biology and stuff. So I'm trying to make it accessible, but you know, we have this reptilian stuff that it's, you know, it's like attacking the animal. So we really have to keep our eye on it and know when to pull back. You can use different techniques. Like if you can retain your calm, I'd have to go into mindfulness a little bit. If you can, if you can retain it and bring your focus, but this is mindfulness to, um, and I don't want to confuse it. Whenever I'll just bring it in. Whenever you um, practice is when you notice your mind is really gabbling and the stress hormones are at fifty you practice like taking your focus to one of your senses. Okay, I'm just go along with it. Like breathing or feeling your feet on the ground or listening to sound because you can't have that screaming brain and connect it to a sense at the same time. So it's either gabble, gabble or that. You won't stay in sense mode, but the exercise of mindfulness is always coming back to that breathing or and so you get to use this muscle that can pull it down to something physical. I don't want to tra train you in mindfulness now. But if you can, while you're screaming, if you can just come back to sensing your breathing or get up and go breathe in another room, it pulls the cortisol down. Now, if you can't do that, because we all lose our, you know, we all lose our footing, then sometimes I'm going into mindfulness. Whenever you use one of your senses, as I said before, the cortisol comes down. So what I do sometimes when somebody's shouting at me, 
sound works, taste works, but you can't do that. But if somebody's shouting, sight is also a sensation. This is weird because I'm talking about mindfulness and I haven't taught trained you in it, but I stare at like one of their eyebrows. And if you really get fascinated with, let's say the left eyebrow and you look at the color and you look at the shape and you look at how they think you're, you're listening to them, but you're not, but you're pulling the cortisol down because you can also listen to the sound of their voices if you're listening to music, but this takes training. But I'm wow. telling you, if you practice it, it's a really good way <laughs> of, <laughs> of bringing down your stress. Just practice it a little bit when, you know, when your family's having an argument, just watch either that or listen to the sound without hearing the words or go back to your breathing. But the other thing is you're in business. If this person needs their ass kicked and you know that's the only way they're going to do it, then give it to them, but retain your authentic self so you can get back to it. Uh, that's what it's a walking a tightrope. I hope I'm making sense. You really are. Sometimes people, you know, I'll, I'll practice with people who are giving me crap. But um, if I fling back something really nice, if somebody's really miserable, sometimes I'll go, hey, tell me about your family. Or if you can get it personal, sometimes it melts them. I mean, if they're in the middle of screaming, that won't work. But if you see somebody starting to build, to say something like, I really like your tie, or bring them back to earth, or, hey, did you find a parking space this morning? Sometimes you can diffuse their rage. I, I just play around with this stuff. It really is just like practicing a, a sport. But you have to be tough. You know, sometimes it is a man's world, so man up. But then if you can get in there and get him talking by saying, where'd you get those glasses? I really like those glasses. People will start to speak human. Or did you get your hair cut? The minute they hear a human voice, they'll match you. Excellent. Really, really helpful. Thank you for that. I'm sorry I went off on mindfulness. It's no. so helpful, I think. Thank you, Kim, for a brilliant sure. question. I've got a question here from Julie who says, and I we can only agree, are you happier now, Ruby, as you look amazing? I don't. I have really good lighting here. Um, <laughs> am I happier? Yeah, I, I can get I can get to that um, uh, homostatic, you know, that calmer state quicker. But that, that means you're ready when something really makes you happy. Whereas I was so fueled up. Even if something wonderful happened, you're still fueled. So there's moments where you go, I think I'm going to die of happiness. The next minute it's gone. But, you know, I still have depression. I can feel when that's coming. You know, we have feelings. Humans, it's in our, it comes with the palate. So, of course, I'm going to wake up angry or sad or miserable or scared but you have to ride the waves a little bit and know in a second that'll change. Thank you. As long as you don't get involved. Getting, yeah. We have a question here from Soraya. So I'm gonna unmute Soraya. Hello? Hello, Soraya. Yes, hi. Um, what do you think about um, what we have in The Guardian this morning? Half of women in the UK fear equality is going back to the 70s. Yeah, well, here's one thing is I don't read newspapers anymore. <laughs> um, so you got to tell me about, I mean, my walls know. So you know how it goes through. I can pick it up anyway. You know, after everybody. Yeah, but, but what, what, what do you think? Are, are women's rights going back, uh, especially after the lockdown and in general with the political atmosphere uh, worldwide. Yeah, I would probably agree that it is going down, as is, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. Because when I was, sorry, growing up in Chicago, it was the coolest thing you could do is go out with a Black <laughs> So I don't know what happened here. Um, yeah, I would agree. But I mean, it's, I'm not, I'm not an activist in the way that I can represent large groups of people. I think do the action yourself and there will be a ripple effect. You know, um, when I started comedy, there were no female comics. So I squiggled in. I don't know how you change the world. I really don't. But I do think it is going backwards. I mean, obviously not, we're not suffragettes anymore, but um, I don't think people listen about that glass ceiling. 
I used to go to conferences about diversity and there'd be these women going on stage in their high heels, right? In their high heels, get what you look like. You know what I mean? Walk the talk. So um, if you take a man on by acting like a man, it ain't gonna work. But these are fine nuances, how you do it. it it's up to the individual, but we can't just whine about stuff. We have to move it. I don't know how you change the world. It's not my expertise, but I agree with you. I agree with the guardian. Something's, we're losing hold here. Yeah. Linda, we have a question from Linda coming your way. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi Linda. Hello, hello, nice to meet you. Um, just wondering, I'm gonna go blast to the past. I remember your fantastic um, show with Jennifer Saunders, Dawn French, Tracy Ullman and stuff, with Girls on Top. So I'm just wondering, and also your show when you did the Ruby Wax show and you had the fantastic, I forget the actress's name, but it was Taffy Turner. There was like, oh, da yeah, she was a brilliant character. But I just wondered, was it because at the time in the 80s, there was a smaller sort of um, choice of women comedians or, or were you just all going about it right okay this hasn't been done before to boys club let's go out and nobody's doing it for us let's write our own comedy so like the girls on top where you work for it all of those fantastic people yeah we did we there were no women unless they were hugely you know heavy and could mock themselves or they were old like Phyllis Diller, you know, she'd mock herself. So we thought we're gonna play really, uh, we're gonna write funnier lines than men can write about women. So, you know, they had to put their guns down because we were there before they were. We could be funnier as women than they could be as men. But I'll tell you something, and it worked. But when I go on a panel, I don't go on panel shows anymore, but back to what the other lady said, you go in the dressing room, right? Or before the show, all the men are being really nice and really vulnerable and saying how much they like your work. Then you go on and you are annihilated as a woman. They start doing their dick, you know, let thing with each other. And as a woman, you're this big. So um, if you get angry, which I've done, you, you're incomprehensible. So um, I don't know how to I, you know what? I work with women. That's how we got ahead. Again, we're back to community. If you work as a group, you will shift it. But sometimes men pretend they're all, not always, but you know, on your side. But then when it comes to the job, they'll annihilate you. So I sort of see the point. Don't get too vulnerable. Get ready. Have your guns cocked, but not out. <laughs> Just remember. <laughs> but it was other women that, that made me successful. That's a great thing to hear today, right? Of, of all days. I'm gonna, uh, Patricia has a question. So I'm gonna unmute Patricia. Hi, Ruby. Um, I'm okay. Patricia Pumley. I'm one of the uh, counselors I work with Sue. And I'm very sorry, I, I've just literally joined the conversation. So I'm sorry for coming to this late. Um, I just joined, I just heard you saying, how do you, you don't know how, is it, you said you don't know how to change things or? Did I hear that correctly? I'm not a politician. Yeah, you know? you're not. Yeah. Um, so, the, yeah, do it small. Yeah, so I, I think one of the ways to change, to change going forward, and this is just my personal opinion, is to challenge. Now, I, when I say challenge, I, I, I mean, I'm only four foot something and I'm disabled. So me trying to physically challenge anybody, we don't go there. But I think challenging, sitting at the table, talking, and using your brain it's a way forward i think it's as a woman and as a disabled woman i'm not afraid to challenge somebody if i think and it's not necessarily that i think somebody might be wrong it's just i want i get curious i want to know why they think that way so i mean the government last week i don't know if you heard um put up the want of a better word a stupid survey called a strategy for disabled people this is going to be government policy and one of the questions they put in was would you have an intimate relationship with a disabled person now 
I'm very cross at the government for putting that there. Yeah, that's I think terrible. If it yeah. was any other minority group, they would be up in arms and rightfully so, and I would be 100% behind them, supporting them and doing my bit to try and challenge them why they've done this. But there's always a part of me there's a curiosity behind. And I want to, as much as I want them to be challenged legally in any other way, I want to know who and why they thought it was acceptable to put that kind of question on a government survey. So just as a woman, and as a disabled woman, I'm, I'm you know, there's a bit of curiosity in me. Yeah. Sometimes it gets me into trouble, other times it does me good. But I just think as a woman today, um, and as a disabled woman, my predecessors, if they hadn't have fought the way they had, I wouldn't be here today in, in, in my position as a councillor. So I'm extremely grateful for all the women before me who have, have fought. So thank you, Ruby, for coming today. And thank to you us. for saying that. You know, um... Again, it's uh, the word challenge is, you know, is a little, um, but the word curiosity is what's going to get everything moving. Because if you, and, and clearly that's empathy. If you meet somebody and say, I'm just curious, what can they do? They're not facing anger. So that's, that's such a great way of, move, of challenging. Mm. But how are you going to find the person who came up with that? You know, I mean, again, I wouldn't know how to organize and we'd all go to the streets with things. But if you got near somebody and just said, I'm curious, you'd win, you know, you'd win hands down. So I, I, I think what you're doing and how you do it, that's, that's the dream is to be curious. Because I am too, but I get angry and that gets in the way. But you're really going to move everything ahead with that curiosity. We have, uh, thank you so much for that, both of you. We have, we have Rana, um, I'm gonna unmute. Hi Rana. Rana. Hello? Hi, hi. Rana, hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, hi. I see um, I'm deaf, so just bear with me. And um, I just wanna say Ruby that you mentioned that you, you, you don't know anything about change or sorry did i mishear that um, you said change is not your expertise and um well i yeah yeah but what i wanted to I, say i didn't say i didn't mean that um i right. i i, I, I take i like i like changing every every other day so change is my middle name but right. I meant, i'm not a politician i don't know how to change the world Ruby, what you've got to understand is that people like yourself, by being you, by being artistic, by being a comedian, by being the first woman, you present opportunities like women myself to be like, well, hold on a minute. She's done it. So why do we have to listen to what the previous government has said and et cetera? So for me, as a young woman, you are the face of change because you, by being you, you've challenged and said, no, there's another dimension kind of thing. So like it, in that respect, like I really respect you for what you've done for women to kind of come out of their homes and be like, there's more than just being a mom, a daughter, bit of admin work. I can do what Ruby does. And that for me is like motivational. And that's what I wanted to say to you. You're doing fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rana. Thanks. That's really touch. Thank you. No, and, you know, my kids used to get angry. You know, they'd say, how come you can't be like the other mothers? You know, they're all sewing bunnies on their kids' hats for Easter and whatever. And now that they're adult, they go, Thank God you weren't one of those women because they're boring. And you know, you're a role model. You know, that moment where you think, oh, should I stay home with them? I mean, each, you know, if you have to, you have to. If you need to challenge, you need to challenge. But 
uh, kids in the end will appreciate that you had a love or a passion or you needed to work. Um, and so I always think, what was I even thinking when I was younger? Of course I should work, <laughs> you know? Anyway, that just has to do with it. It's not bravery, it's necessity. And to do something, if you're lucky enough that you love, that's feeding your mind. And if you don't feed your mind when you're older, you're, you're dead on arrival. <laughs> And we have we have so many questions coming in, Ruby. So we're oh, good. Now we have questions. Now good. we have a lot. So I'm going to um, ask another three, and then we might just see how you feel. Um, one uh, here, we have a question from Alison. Will lockdown change Frazzle Cafe? And if yes, how do you imagine the cafe will change once we're unlocked? Well, we'll always stay online because it was so hard to get people to you know the Birmingham thing, you know Marks and Spencers. Well, I, who knows what's going to happen, but it really works well online because we can have people from different countries uh, and they you watch them bond. So we'll do that. Um, Alex, can I say what we're thinking or no? Why not? Go for it. Oh, OK, I, I this was always based on Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we don't do the 12 step, but it has a it has a form like that. Um, I. The dream in many years or one year, whatever, is that people can run the way AA is. People, obviously we have to train them a little, train them and keep our eyes on, you know, whether they're holding their boundaries of that uh, the public could run their own Frazzle cafes. Kids could run their own Frazzle cafes. People at work could run their own. I mean, they can't just call it Frazzle and have a coffee morning. But if you stay within the rules, you know, AA is run by people who were alcoholics so that would be the dream is that you you could still come to mind because I I would be devastated if I didn't run it and I'm sure the hosts wouldn't but why can't we spread this bigger because nobody else is doing this you know they have um, book weeks they have flower arranging they have wine tasting this is about being human so uh, I, I have to spread it wider beautiful um, a question from Sarah I'm going to ask to unmute Sarah here Do we have Sarah? Hey, I'm I'm slightly starstruck. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassingly jittery at the moment because I'm just so thrilled to meet you, or albeit through a screen. Um, I've been a big fan since the 80s and 90s, since you burst onto our TV screen. And I thought, gosh, who is this force of nature? And I, I think the way you were you were, the way you presented yourself just validated me being able to be like that it's okay that I am like this woman anyway I just wanted to say thank you for your books and particularly Sane New World I remember reading it a particularly difficult time in my life I sat on a bench the top of Primrose Hill and I was practicing the mindfulness strategies that you were suggesting putting my feet on the floor, listening to, to what I could hear around me, focusing on particular things, and it really helped. Um, I think I'd had a kind of breakdown with a work situation. I was a single parent at the time. I was struggling with a particularly, um, I don't want to say challenging. I think she's an adult now and she's just being her. But um, I was on my own with a teenager and things were hard. Um, and I think I was just grasp, grappling with a, 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 how do I live my life? How do I come out from under this dark cloud? How do I gain more positivity and, and have a, a formula, if you like, for responding to shitty things that are coming my way? And I just wanted to thank you, really, because that book was a Bible for me that I still refer to. Um, and I think it was so interesting you talking about being your authentic self I've worked on for quite some time. And I think I'm actually doing now in my 50s. Um, so, again, thank you for that. And just thank you. I'm just thrilled to oh. see you and very grateful to you. So thank you. Thank you. Oh. I think you were talking about the book Frazzled because that was mindfulness. But who knows? It was a mindfulness guide for the frazzle. That might have been the one. And it gave exercises. But maybe it was saying the world. Anyway, thank you. So many brilliant books. That you well, they're not all about mindfulness. So thank no, you. I'm sure. Thanks. Um, 
Here's a question well, coming from Adrian. Um, and we might need to make this last one. I, I, in, it, it's an interesting question, Ruby. Uh, Adrian asks, in the 70s and 80s, it was really important and helpful to have women only meetings. Do you think this is still the case? Women only meetings? Huh. What, what kind of meetings? I don't know, it's in the chat. Adrian, are you, would you like to elaborate? Yeah. Let's see if I can find Adrian. Depends what kind of meetings. Uh -huh. Do we have Adrian? We don't, I don't think. I've just had a message in the chat from an Alison saying Women's Institute. So I'm not sure if that's what it refers to. But in the meantime, there's a quick question, which is which is Ruby's book? Which of Ruby's books is particularly about mindfulness? Oh, uh, uh, there's one called uh, Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled. And that's, uh, that is mindfulness exercises, but done in my way, but based on uh, the real mindfulness teacher. <laughs> who oh. was my, um, you know what I mean? Some people make it up. Uh, so mindfulness guide for the frazzle, but the same new world and um, how to be human with a monk and a neuroscientist, clearly the monk and I give mindfulness exercises at the end. And the monk was really yeah. my favorite. And just to say to everybody that we, um, there are Ruby's books are available in the library in Huntington Film Libraries and also eBooks. So you can, there's quite there's lots and lots of ways to get hold of that material, if you if you're interested, which I'm sure you are. Thank um, you. I I think we found Adrian as well. So wonderful. Adrian, can we hear you? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Ruby, for taking the question. What I was referring to was in perhaps in the 60s, even 70s and 80s, we formed lots of women's only groups to talk about issues that concerned us, whether they be to do with health or politics or relationships. So it was women only spaces really. Um, and I think for me, that was really helpful at the time. Um, and I just wondered what you thought about having such meetings or spaces for women without men, basically. You know, it depends the situation. I, sure. I think when people say, what do I do about my kid? They have mental health issues. I say, you have to meet with other people in that situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was only felt kind of safe when I was with people with depression, as I think, you know, they're bereavement things. People don't know what it's like. So to get your power base and to make you feel, uh, you know, held, you need to be with people you identify with. Later on, when you want to challenge the world, you 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 learn what you learn from your base and then take it out so in in frazzled it's maybe someday we'll have female or you know we have for one for black lives matter and lg you know the those groups but ultimately it's humans uh and maybe by proxy you know men seeing how vulnerable a woman could be and still powerful if they're not themselves they learn by watching so you need your power base, but then move on so people can see how powerful you are. That's a brilliant way to end this fantastic conversation. I thank you so much. Thank everybody. you. I really All loved it. Brilliant people. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Get on, see if any more here again. I just want to say thank you both so much for a fascinating um, event. I'm really very grateful to you for taking the time. Thank you, Ruby, especially as I know you're in foreign climes. So thank you so much for, for just um, giving us a, a wonderful picture of the work that you've done and what an extraordinary women you both are, it, leading in, in sectors that, you know, traditionally have been very male dominated. So I'm very, very um, delighted to have been able to have you both come to the event so thank you very much and thank you to everybody who took the time to join us today a really exciting opportunity to hear from somebody um you know who, who's really walked that walk so i just want to thank everybody as well for joining and to say um that's it really thank you and look forward to seeing you all hopefully for next year's wonderful event so you know, we, we look forward to that. But again, Ruby and Rachel, thank you so, so much for taking the time. I'm really grateful to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, so Ruby. Thank Happy you. International Women's Day. Thank you to you too. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day, everyone.
Thank you. So great. Bye-bye. Thanks all.